Right. Now, he had you working already beginning in late 1961 uh, while the convention was going on on his nascent, not yet born uh, campaign for governor. No, no, let's year. put it this way. Yes. I said, George, do you want me to do a strategy memo on what it would be like to run for governor? And he said, okay, well, I'll go ahead and do it. <laughs> It was not as though he came to me. Well, maybe you put the idea in his head. He I never would have thought no, no, of it. No, 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 no. He had that <laughs> idea in his head. Okay. Uh, and some of us had an idea that maybe he'd be president down the line, sure. too. Sure. Well, we'll get to that. Okay. But in any event, at that point, you put this together. Uh, by the time you got through putting together your memo and he decided to run, had he already decided on the people at the convention like Seidman and Dan Hoff and Glenn Allen uh, that they were the people he wanted to bring with him to Lansing if he became governor? Do you think he kind of had that in mind? I think he had it in mind. He didn't articulate that. But one of the things that the convention did in Michigan is bring new blood into the political system, particularly of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And when he was elected governor, there were five, five of us delegates who ended up in the executive office of, of the governor. So he must have had, uh, well, he also, when he was at American Motors, had a wide span of control. In other words, I, I organized the executive office, uh, not along the traditional patterns of a press secretary and a chief of staff. Because to me, a chief of staff in the White House or in the governor's office means you're, the, you're in effect, you're the president or the governor. Mm. Well, George knew how to, to exercise a span of control with four or five different people and he could handle that. So that is the way eventually we, we organized the office of the governor and he placed people like Dan Hoff, Dick Van Dusen, Glenn Allen, myself and others in the executive office because he had worked with us in the convention. And didn't he have kind of a secretary slash gatekeeper, Peg Little? Peg Little. Uh, who kind of, she wasn't the chief of staff in the traditional sense, like you say, but if anybody had any control over who actually opened the door into the inner sanctum of the governor's office, it was her, right? It was Peg. <laughs> I mean, she called control like his lunch. <laughs> Did he need money to go on a trip? She'd give that, you know, she took care of that. Uh, she pretty much ran the thing. Right. And but, in order to get to George, you had to go through pay. Right. But, but the five or six of you who had your various spheres of influence, you would all huddle and have meetings and decide overall what needed to be done, what was the tone, and then one by one, if you had to go see him, you'd go through Peg to go see and talk directly to the governor. Right. right? Yeah. We had, we had really had direct access. It right. wasn't a matter of having to go in through a chief of staff or really Peg would just uh, facilitate it. Right. But uh, right. the decisions were made by a group. There was a woman named Lucille Kaplinger, I think, who didn't, she work for Steve Nesbitt when he was chairman of the convention and it was in the office right next to yours when you were chairman of administration. And then she followed the governor to uh, Lansing and she, ended up working, I think, in legislation. Right. And eventually she took it over. Yeah, she, be, she became the legislative assistant. Right. And then eventually it was in charge of relationships with the legislature. Right. I mean, a really difficult job. Very, very much so. I think Bob Danhoff had yep. that job originally, and then he went over to the legal side when Dick Van Dusen left, mm -hmm. and Lucille took his place. Well, okay, so, uh, George Romney's governor, he set up his office. The Republicans control the legislature um, for that first two years of his tenure, 1963 and 64. How did the governor get along with the legislature? A lot of those legislators who couldn't run for CONCON, as you said, were kind of the old style establishment, rural uh, people that were part of the conservative faction of Republicans in the convention. So did he have a feeling of deja vu all over again? I've seen these people before. Are these types of people? How did he work with them? Well, it wasn't what you'd call a loving relationship. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, 
he knew how to deal with these people, and he could. And of course, in the first few months that we were in office, we had to call, we had to vote on the convention uh, result, which was a new constitution. Right, oh yeah. Well, and this is sort of an aside, but George decided that the passage of that constitution was key to his success as governor. So he put it all on the line. For four months, he campaigned solidly for that constitution against some of the people in the legislature who were opposed to it. Right. And by getting that constitution, we were able to get to reorganize the state government. He put me in charge of that. Uh, I still get uh, flack from that, um, as well as the state income tax and some other things. But had we not had that constitution, and had he not put his full weight behind it, uh, it would have been an entirely different uh, administration. Yeah, and by the way, I mean, the governor took office in January of 1963, and the vote on CONCON was in March, wasn't it? I think it was just two months later, yeah. and he'd been campaigning ever since he was elected the previous November, like you say, four months, and it only passed by 7,000 votes. Yeah. Barely passed. I mean, think what it would have been like if it hadn't passed. Well, I think what it would have been like if he hadn't put his full weight behind it, because I, I still think he got it passed and almost by himself and against a significant Republican and, of course, Democratic opposition. Well, let me ask you this. You mentioned that, uh, of course, you were his executive assistant for administration, and the Democrats uh, were not yet in control of the legislature. That came the next year. Uh, and the Constitution set up outlines like there could be no more than 20 principal departments. Mm -hmm. But did you have to come up with the actual legislation that put in place what were the names of these departments? Yes. Well, the Constitution required that the legislature do it. Right. But they wouldn't do it. Okay. Oh, they didn't. Okay. So what I did is I called a meeting of the principal staff people uh, like Van Dusen and like Glen Allen and others, yeah. and we went to Mackinac Island. And I told them, I said, no phone calls, no visits, nothing. We're going to spend three days and decide the principles of reorganization. <clears throat> Twenty departments uh, headed by a director um, reporting to the governor. All of the things, that the policy decisions that had to be made. So at the end of the three days, when we flew back from Mackinac, we had the, we had the bones or elements right. of the reorganization, which eventually passed uh, the legislature. Okay, but now let me ask you this. You say the Republicans in the legislature in 63, 64, majority in each chamber, they were resistant. But then in 64, the Democrats got elected big time. For the first time since before World War II, 1938, yeah. the Democrats took control of both the House and Senate with huge majorities. Were they the ones that actually ended up passing the executive reorganization bills? It passed in 1965. Well, that's under the Democrats. I know. Right. Well, but there was no choice because the, the Constitution required it. Right. And if, if the governor didn't do it, the legislature was supposed to do it, and they wouldn't do it. So that was the way we got it through. You're facing a deadline. Right. You have to pass it. But Romney himself must have been pretty cooperative with this in this effort. Oh, must, yeah. Yeah. Well, we, he had a rule uh, that if any legislator came into the executive office, he would see him or her immediately. And Peg Little was instructed to, to bring the legislator, legislator right in to see the governor. He did that as well as something we called uh, the Citizens' Day. Uh, every Thursday morning, oh, yeah. you could come into the governor's office and you could see him for 10 minutes. It didn't matter who you were. And when you came in and sat down across from the governor, the state trooper would be sitting there. And the engineering department at the University of Michigan fixed the little setup where he would push the button and you could see the 10 minutes go, and when the 10 minutes was up, the bell would ring, the governor would stand up, and you would leave. Well, one thing that happened was every State Department head was in his office on Thursday morning, 
because the governor, if somebody came in to say something about, about welfare, yeah. he would call the department. And if the, and if the uh, director, wasn't director there, was, was not, not there good. and didn't answer the phone, there was hell to pay. <laughs> but that, you know, that was the sort of openness that he yeah. felt he needed to do with the legislature as well as with citizens. Well, that was a fantastic public relations ploy, I'd say, by the governor. I'm saying I think he was sincere, but it had to be really great. Was the news media allowed to sit in on these sessions where the citizen came in or not? I don't remember that they even they ever asked. Because, really? But, but I, I think the answer would have been no. I mean, this is your 10 minutes with yeah. the governor. And a lot but they of these, wrote about it a lot, I mean, yeah. about the fact that this was happening, right? But a lot of it was personal problems with welfare yeah. and Social Security, uh, people in prison and so on. So I, I guess we felt, I don't remember now exactly how that went, that uh, this needed to be private. Was George Romney himself the person who really came up with this idea, or was it a collegial thing between you know, the five or six of you on his main staff and him, or what? Can you remember? Yeah, it was my idea. <laughs> well, don't be bashful, that's well, okay, but he bought it, he right? Bought it, and he yeah. thought it was a great idea. Yeah, I think it was inspired. I don't think any governor's done it since, right? No, I don't think so. Did he keep it going indefinitely? I don't think he did indefinitely, because no, he had I think, too many other disputes. I think it was dropped after a couple of years. A couple of years, yeah.